Hello, I'm Peter Van Dusen. This is Primetime Politics. The focus of our program tonight, a major shift in the federal political landscape that will see the uncertainty of a minority parliament replaced by a deal that will ensure the Liberal government remains in power until 2025. Under the terms of the deal, which kicks in today, the NDP will support the Liberals on all confidence votes, including votes on the next four budgets. In return, the Liberals have promised to deliver key elements of NDP priorities, and that includes a new dental care program for families with an annual income of less than $90,000. It would start with people under 12 years of age in 2022, so this year, then extend to all people under 18 years old, seniors and people living with a disability the next year. And finally, to all eligible Canadians by 2025. Passing a Canada Pharmacare Act by the end of 2023. Moving forward on the Liberal campaign promise of national long-term care standards with a new bill, the Safe Long-Term Care Act. Extending the Rapid Affordable Housing Initiative for an additional year. Launching 10-day paid sick leave this year for all federally regulated workers. Penalizing financial institutions who've made strong profits during the COVID-19 pandemic through a so far undescribed tax change in the uh, near term, expanding uh, as well, expanding election day voting from one to three days, allowing voters to cast a ballot at any polling spot in their electoral district. What the NDP doesn't get is a seat at the cabinet table and no seat was offered. Here's how party leaders characterized the Liberal NDP agreement. What this means is that during this uncertain time, the government can function with predictability and stability, present and implement budgets, and get things done for Canadians. One of the honours of my life to be able to get help to people that's meaningful, that's going to make people's lives better, and we know that kids are going to get dental care because of this plan. We know that people are going to get their medication because of this plan. We know that because of the power that we've used, we're going to help people find a home to live in. We're going to help people feel better and, and feel safer in a world that's pretty scary right now. We found out last night that the NDP and the Liberals were meeting secretly and they've cooked up a backroom deal that would see Justin Trudeau get the majority power that he tried desperately to get last fall in the last election, but he failed to get. This deal means that Canadians have woken up to an in essence, an NDP Liberal majority government. I would fear, if I was living in any Canadian province or territory, as well as, as it is a case, I live in Quebec, I would fear that this is one of the strongest push in recent history towards centralization of the jurisdictions and powers in the ends of the federal government against the will, and in some cases, the unanimous will of the provinces and territories. Well, let's follow up with the House Leader for the NDP. He's Peter Julian. He joins me now. Uh, Mr. Julian, thanks again for your time this evening. Good to see you. Uh, why, did the NDP, see you. why did the NDP need a written agreement to achieve these NDP priorities, particularly on dental care and pharma care? Why not just say to the Liberals, hey, if you don't make these a priority and put them in the budget, you'll not have our support and you'll face the possibility of defeat. Well, we, we wanted to make sure that we had something that actually uh, had a real benefit for constituents right across the country. The average member of parliament has about 30,000 people that don't have access to good dental care. And uh, the, the dental care component, something the NDP and Jagmeet Singh has been, has been pushing for years, uh, has a real impact on Canadians' quality of life. I've, I've, I've met constituents whose teeth are literally rotting out because they can't afford to pay uh, for dental care and, and they need uh, that essential uh, basic dental care as well. So this, this makes a big difference in people's lives who wanted to get it down on paper. That's a commitment that everybody can see and we'll be um, continuing to, to make a difference for people in this parliament. That's uh, the objective that Jagmeet Singh and the NDP have set. Okay, to be clear, how, how binding is this deal? Can either side walk away and under what circumstances? Well, we, we've said that these are the things that the Liberal government absolutely must, must do. And if they don't do it, if they don't keep their word, uh, then we, we will make other choices. Uh, uh, as Jagmeet Singh said this morning, uh, we are very optimistic that this is going to make a, a real uh, difference in the lives of Canadians. This is first significant expansion of health care in over a generation. And it's about time. When, when Tommy Douglas fought 
and uh, work with Lester B. Pearson to put in place universal health care. The intention was always to expand universal health care beyond, to ensure that we had pharma care and dental care. Uh, essentially, uh, health care from the tip of, tip of your head uh, to the soles of your yeah. feet. And, and now we have an opportunity to do that and make a big difference in the lives of Canadians. Do, do, you, do you acknowledge there's a political risk here? What, what if the Liberal motivation is, is to buy lots of runway to do things they will claim credit for come the next election and then marginalize the role of the NDP come election time? They'll, they'll claim the credit for doing all these things because it's fine to have ideas, but they'll say you need a Liberal government to get them implemented. Um, how does this build electoral support for New Democrats? Well, the, the important thing is it makes a difference for Canadians. That's that's our fundamental push. And, and the NDP has always been at its best when we, we push, we, we put aside the issue of partisan um, political advantage and we focus on getting things done. That's how Tommy Douglas was able to achieve universal health care. That's how we were able to achieve uh, the pension system we have in place. That, that's uh, why Jack Layton was able to achieve the famous Jack Layton budget. It's how we were in the last parliament able to obtain substantial benefits on COVID uh, that were, albeit temporary, but made a big difference in people weathering that pandemic. And, and now with uh, the, the adoption of the Canada Pharmacare Act next year and the putting in place of, uh, of dental care for Canadians who need it, uh, starting with this budget and moving through the next uh, next few years, it'll make a substantial difference what? in the lives of Canadians. So that there's no doubt. What if there's an increase in military spending in the upcoming budget? Is that a deal breaker? Well, what, what the agreement calls for as well uh, is ongoing discussions between uh, our, our leader and the prime minister, uh, the house leaders, the whips, and we also have an oversight committee to, to work through. You know, there, there are a lot of hypotheticals in the coming years. And a part of what is in the agreement is to ensure that there's good communications and discussions. Yeah, but that, that's uh, not what I'm asking. I'm asking if, if, if there's increased defense spending in the budget, is that a deal breaker for the NDP? Are you OK with seeing increased defense spending as long as it's not at the expense of social spending? It, you're, you're presuming something. And my my response is. There are there are mechanisms put in place to ensure uh, that we have those discussions beforehand. But uh, and I will say this as I as we've been saying all along, uh, the, the NDP believes that we need to be adequately uh, equipping our Canadian forces, particularly for the peacekeeping roles uh, that may may come to, to be in in Ukraine. One one would only hope that there will be a truce that the uh, that the uh, the carnage will stop and and there may be a role for Canadians to start playing that peacekeeping role again. Okay. We need to adequately equip our soldiers to make sure that happens. All right. Uh, Mr. Julian, thanks for your time tonight. Time's short, but I appreciate you uh, taking time to give us your perspective. Uh, good to talk to you again. Thanks so much. Mark Holland is the uh, House Leader for the government side. Mr. Holland, good to see you again. And I understand you're uh, fighting the effects of COVID-19. I hope it, uh, it all goes well for you and uh, that you come through it okay. Good to see you tonight. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, why did your government feel you needed this deal with the NDP? Well, I think, you know, after the last election six months ago, uh, it was very clear Canadians wanted us to work together on the priorities that we ran on and other parties ran on. And uh, so we had over the last six months been looking at areas of overlap, areas of common ground. Uh, and as we uh, worked through uh, that period of time, uh, particularly with the tumult that we've seen uh, and the rancor, uh, it became obvious that um, uh, that finding a way forward that would allow us um, to ensure stability uh, that still recognizes that we have big differences between our parties and allows for those differences to take mm. place, but creates a framework of stability was important. Uh, can, uh, and uh, go ahead. Uh, can you respond to the opposition criticism today that if uh, that this deals effectively, uh, you know, political blackmail and a, and a Justin Trudeau power grab, uh, buying a longer life in government by promising to satisfy a few NDP priorities. Respond to that. Well, I, you know, I, we're in a parliamentary democracy, and in a parliamentary democracy, uh, all parties uh, in a minority context have to work together, and they have to find a path forward, uh, and that's exactly what we've done. Uh, and so, to characterize that. Uh, as anything other than parliamentary collaboration, is unfortunate. Uh, I think that the uh, the opposition, particularly the Conservatives, who have been, uh, you know, really full of partisan rancor, uh, need to take a step back and ask uh, what Canadians expect of them in a minority government. Uh, 
Uh, there is a responsibility for shared governing. Uh, there's a responsibility uh, all the time. Remember, this is a supply and confidence agreement. Most things are not supply and confidence. Right. So there's every opportunity for them and other parties to find uh, common ground to get things done instead of just opposing and being angry right. all the time. Uh, liberals didn't campaign on a, on a national pharmacare plan in the last election or a national dental plan. Uh, so why is it suddenly a liberal priority now? And, and who gets credit for making it happen when uh, and presumably if it does? Uh, who gets credit, the liberals or the NDP? Well, first, Peter, on the pharmacare piece, we we have campaigned on uh, pharmacare, and uh, we had uh, a Dr. Eric Hoskins who was le leading up task force of how we could make that work, working with provincial and uh, and territorial partners. Uh, and it's a complicated piece, uh, but it's one that's essential that we get done. Uh, and I think uh, with respect to dental, uh, we recognize that there are uh, uh, countless Canadians uh, who are in a circumstance where they don't have coverage. Uh, these are, this specifically is going to be addressing families uh, with less than 90,000 um, uh, dollars in income who are incredibly stretched with all kinds of demands on their budget and dental care is extremely important. So, you know, what, what we've always had as a commitment is to improve the lives of those that are in the middle class and those who are struggling and working hard to join it. Uh, and I think those priorities fit very well with uh, with what we're trying to do as a government can, overall. Can can you promise can you promise the NDP as is one of their demands that any new uh, spending on defense uh, a lot of conversation around that these days uh, that in, if there's any new spending on defense in the budget it will not come at the expense of those NDP priorities. Well, you know, we've made a commitment uh, to uh, to increase our defense spending by uh, by over uh, 90 percent uh, from where it was. Uh, I believe it was at 2017 levels, uh, certainly uh, much higher than it was uh, during the Stephen Harper period, uh, because we recognize and we watch what's happening in the Ukraine and elsewhere in the world that Canada has an incredibly important role to play militarily uh, in helping to provide peace, order and stability. Uh, with our partners. And, uh, you know, we've always been incredibly prudent uh, when, when dealing with the fiscal framework and making sure that we uh, fund the commitments that we make. And I think there's every opportunity for us to do that important work in defense and also be able to uh, deliver uh, those services that are critical uh, to help those that are in the middle class. All right. Uh, Mark Holland, government house leader. Uh, thanks for your time tonight and uh, be well. And we'll talk again soon. Thanks so much, Peter. John Broussard is the House Leader for the Official Opposition. He joins me now. Uh, Mr. Broussard, uh, good to see you again. Thanks for taking time to speak with me. Uh, look, w what do you think this deal between the NDP and the Liberals uh, delivers to Canadians? Where do you think we are here? Well, I think it's a, uh, certainly a costly deal um, based on what they are proposing that they're going to work on. Just the uh, two issues of pharmacare and dental care alone represents about $100 billion in expenditures. Um, the NDP platform that was costed out by the Parliamentary Budget Officer in the last election was about uh, over $200 billion. Uh, so this is going to be a, a costly coalition between the Liberals and the NDP. Uh, we saw something interesting in the House of Commons this afternoon. Uh, the New Democrats had a motion to uh, urge the federal government to impose its own proposed surtax on uh, on uh, the wealth of insurance companies and banks, but the Liberals abstained. What did you make of that? Well, I, I, frankly, Peter, I thought it was a joke. Um, you know, we are sent uh, to this place to uh, stand up in our seats and be counted. Um, obviously, it represents uh, a part of the deal that we weren't aware of, at least not what we had seen uh, that was released by either party. Um, so I guess that means going forward that any time the NDP puts something forward through their supply days or opposition motions, as most people know them at, uh, if the Liberals don't agree with it, they're just going to sit down in their seats and they're not going to vote. So, uh, um, you know, the dynamics, uh, it was really interesting to see how this played out today. And I suspect we may see more of this going forward. The Prime Minister and the leader of the NDP, Mr. Singh, both said today this deal is all about providing certainty and stability for Canadians at a time of instability. What, what do you say to that? I'm not sure how they can say that, Peter, uh, quite frankly. Um, September 2021, Canadians elected a minority Liberal Parliament. I think they sent the Prime Minister a message at that time. Um, 
you know, he effectively had a majority because the NDP had been voting with him uh, on almost every issue that had come forward in Parliament. So I don't think they really needed this uh, to uh, to function. Um, you know, they could have moved their legislative agenda through the House. Uh, the NDP had clearly shown their support. So I, I'm not quite sure that uh, that's the reason for it. Mm. I, uh, you know, I, I'm concerned about some of the aspects of this deal, uh, in particular, uh, as it relates to committees, uh, particularly uh, openness and transparency. You know, committees have a lot of opportunity to uh, really hold the government to account, including the NDP members of the committee. Uh, I can speak to the Emergency uh, Act Committee that was recently constituted, um, you know, the Health Committee uh, through the Winnipeg Lab documents. Uh, part of this agreement that they came up with, at least the part that I've seen with respect to committees, means that uh, in in many circumstances, that information may not be available to committees, like the production of documents similar to what was done in the Winnipeg lab uh, situation. The NDP at the time supported the production of documents so that we could find out what went on within the Winnipeg labs as it relates to the Chinese right. Communist Party. Uh, the way uh, I'm reading this agreement uh, means that the NDP NDP is basically going to allow, uh, you know, the sort of obstruction um, of the will of the committee to not to happen. So, so it's it's really concerning okay. uh, with respect to that. Uh, the other part of this that is concerning as well is that there's going to be regular meetings between the House leaders of the NDP and the Liberal Party, the party whips, the Prime Minister and the leader of the NDP are going to meet quarterly, leaving out the official opposition. So, uh, you know, this is effectively a coalition uh, government that uh, that's in place right now and i know people don't see it as defined as a coalition but uh, but peter everything that i've seen uh indicates that this may have consequences as well for the conservative uh, leadership race um because uh we, we see with this uh this deal who you know whoever wins the conservative leadership in september is destined for the opposition benches uh for perhaps the next three years um could that actually be a, a good uh, thing and allowing a new leader time to assume the job without the threat of an election. Well, in a minority situation, there's always a threat of a, an election, uh, and there may be a threat going forward if the NDP doesn't get what they want. Uh, they can certainly mm -hmm. not support the government. We can see the government fall in a minority situation. I think whoever the next leader of the Conservative Party is uh, will have, I think, enough time to uh, make their views known, to perform in the House of Commons, to show Canadians a real alternative. Uh, obviously, three years extends that, uh, but my concern is more of you know, what's, what kind of damage can be done uh, with respect to sectors of our economy that clearly the Liberals and the NDP are aligned on, specifically the natural resource okay. sector. I mean, we both know where they stand on this. Uh, at a time when clean Canadian energy will be in demand around the world, uh, we've effectively got a coalition, an ideologically aligned coalition that uh, will be working together to, uh, to not support the natural resource sector and provide that clean Canadian energy okay. around the world and to uh, really fill that void uh, that Russia is supplying, for example, to Europe, uh, this is going to cause problems in sectors of our economy that uh, I think are concerning. And the other right. thing that concerns me, too, is the magnitude of, of the cost of what they're proposing and how that plays out for future generations in this country. All right, we'll leave it at that for tonight. Uh, John Broussard, Thanks, Peter. good of you to take the time. Take care, sir. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks, Peter. because of massive inflation which is caused by the out of control spending of the old Liberal government. Now, Canadians are going to be living with a new NDP Liberal government and that price tag has just skyrocketed. The NDP Liberal government's initial platform will cost over $200 billion and that is just the tip of the iceberg. Can the NDP Liberal Prime Minister tell Canadians how much this backroom deal is going to cost them? Yes. To the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we made a commitment in the last election to invest in housing, to invest in supporting for families, to invest in childcare, to grow the economy, to fight the pandemic, to move forward on fighting climate change. These are all things that we continue to be focused on. And Mr. Speaker, what we're going to see is an ability to work across party lines to reduce the toxic partisanship that we've seen in the past in this House and actually move forward on delivering concrete 
greatly for Canadians. That's what Canadians want. That's what we're going to deliver. I want to bring in two colleagues now from the Parliamentary Press Gallery to discuss the new Liberal NDP deal. Tonda McCharles is a parliamentary reporter for the Toronto Star. Bob Fife is the Parliamentary Bureau Chief for the Globe and Mail. Good to see you both. Uh, Tonda, let me start with you if I can. We've, we've heard all the political parties characterize what this deal means and what it might mean for Canadians today and why it was done. How would you characterize it and what do you think it means? Well, I'm still digesting it, but I think the best description I heard was just from a liberal up on the hill. Uh, I just came down and, you know, he said, it's a marriage. It's a marriage of convenience without the priest, without the party, and without the sex. It's just going to be straight up. Here's the deal we're in for seemingly till 2025. But that liberal gave it really only a couple of years. Um, look, I think that we can see what it gives the liberals. It gives them a guarantee uh, guaranteed run. The bigger question, I think, um, is what it gives the NDP. And I think uh, while they are claiming victory out of, you know, uh, getting some dental care and pharma care programs moving ahead, um, I, I'm not sure strategically over the long term if this positions Jagmeet Singh as a Tommy Douglas, mm -hmm. to be honest. I think it's going to electorally present them problems with trying to raise funds, candidates, and basically make another go at an election. I think this signals the end of Jagmeet Singh's leadership uh, in a few years. And for the Conservatives, it really does give them runway now to sort of look at their leadership race in a different way. All right, uh, Bob, uh, I'm going to circle back to some of this as we continue the conversation as well, too. What do you think this deal uh, really means and why the Liberals and the Democrats have gone down this road? Well, from the Liberals, it's obvious. Uh, they had been complaining about the toxic environment in the last parliament where it was difficult getting legislation passed, that there were committee hearings that uh, were going after the Liberals, whether it was on issues of China or, or uh, sexual harassment within the military. And uh, this was causing them a lot of problems. And so they were able to get together. with. They tried in November to work out a deal with the NDP and it didn't work. It resumed in January under pretty secret negotiations. And so from the Liberals' point of view, they've got a clear runway until 2025. Uh, and I agree with um, Tonda that I'm not quite sure whether the NDP get to benefit from this. They can certainly tell people that they've got uh, dental care and, and some movement on pharma care and other issues like that. But in the end, uh, it could end up benefiting the Liberals far more than it's going to benefit the NDP. Yeah. And as for the Conservatives, uh, it's actually a blessing in disguise for them because whoever wins that leadership is going to have a great difficulty trying to pull the party together because there's been so much meanness and spite and nastiness going around amongst the leadership candidates. And that'll all, so they'll need to heal the wounds of the party. And they'll also need to, ha they'll have time to develop policies to be able to run against the liberals right. and you know this this deal liberal ndp deal is going to be really easy for them to spin to uh, to canadians as as you know a lot of spending uh and uh, and and uh not not much reigning in spending or but, or re regard to the uh, economic growth yeah you know, let's talk about that tonda what do you think this deal does mean for federal spending and how the government will decide where the money goes now uh because it's got this deal with the ndp and to some extent uh, we already know what it's what it's agreed to and who knows what else might be involved as the deal goes forward? Mm -hmm. No, it means billions for billions and billions more for federal spending. Um, look, the, there's a reason why the Liberals had gone slow on pharmacare and they'd only given a passing nod in a throne speech once upon a time, two years ago, to dental care, just to keep the NDP happy at the time. And they've never made any concrete moves towards it. Really, uh, I think the bigger question now becomes how does Christia Freeland, in a budget that's to come in a couple of weeks, uh, square that circle of trying to put Canada back on a fiscal track that's reasonable and solid and gets us somewhere close to starting to paying down the bills. But also, how does this government meet the expectations it itself has set up that, that the government would increase military spending mm -hmm. to address the crisis in Europe. And what everybody has said is now a changed international geopolitical situation. I, I find it is going to be, I, I think they must be going crazy over at finance, rewriting the budget as we speak. Uh, let me hear you on that, Bob, because I thought it was interesting today when Jagmeet Singh was asked a number of times, I think Tonda, you asked him one time as well, like what's the bottom line for you on increased military spending versus social spending and other priorities? It sounded like what he, his basic answer was, look, uh, 
uh, was largely mute on increased defense spending as long as it doesn't take money away from other social spending. And where do you think that leaves the government, Bob? Well, you know, that is a that's a big deal because the NDP have traditionally uh, uh, been opposed to increases in defense spending, saying any of this money should go to humanitarian relief. And he's uh, he said, look, um, the military does need uh, new equipment and they need new money and that the NDP will not uh, stand in the in the way of increased defense spending. He wasn't he didn't go as far as saying that we need to increase uh, defense spending to two percent of uh, GDP, Mm -hmm. which is what uh, NATO countries want Canada to do. But Clearly, uh, there is going to have to be increased military spending. Uh, Anita Nan, the defense minister, has said she's got aggressive uh, options uh, before Ms. Freeland for the budget. Uh, and so when you couple defense spending with uh, the costly social program spending that this deal brings about, we're going to have, there's not going to be any reining in of any spending. And I can imagine the business community is uh, pulling their hair out and people and economists like Don Drummond are pulling their hair out because uh, there is no sense of how do we restrain government spending. And as you know, uh, Peter, uh, in the long run, it all comes back to roost. Somebody's got to pay for it at the end of the day. Right. Uh, Tonda, you talked about, I mean, what, when you talked earlier a little bit about, uh, you know, possible risks to the NDP, where could this thing go bad uh, for the NDP to the point where, you know, it really might affect them in the next election campaign? If I suppose the Liberals, if the Liberals claim all the credit for stuff they've done, the NDP is sort of a, uh, an extra thumb as part of the process. Who gets credit for all of this? Well, there's a few things, right? Like, so there's that, like, basically, what's the reason to vote NDP if the Liberals will deliver the, the NDP platform? What's the reason for donors and volunteers and candidates to step forward for an NDP party that is essentially given over uh, all the decision-making levers to the Liberals? Uh, even though there's this agreement in place and they say they can still talk, I mean, effectively, the, the NDP has promised confidence now on all the money bills going forward for three years. Um, they say they can pull out, but then it, I, I just find that the risks are high for the NDP in this. I don't, they had those levers at their disposal. And when you have the ability to threaten a liberal government with losing power if uh, you don't implement these, you know, X or Y step. That seems like a stronger, to me, carrot than this so-called stick of an agreement that they could, that they can th- still threaten yeah. to pull at any time. I just, I find that it, their credibility has suffered as a result. And but, but we'll see. Look, if yeah. if the Liberals do deliver, and Jagmeet Singh gets to c- claim that we delivered dental care and we delivered pharmacare, uh, if those things do pan out, I suppose that's a, that's a policy victory for them, isn't it? But yeah. um, I don't know, if you're in the grassroots today, you're wondering what was all that about? What was all that talk just, about how Justin Trudeau was untrustworthy and couldn't be worked with? Just got 30 seconds left, Bob. Uh, let me hear you on that and uh, yeah. the, the uh, risks look, here look, for the they're, they're also getting sucked in here because uh, they, they're promised uh, the House leaders will uh, have regular meetings. Jugmeet will have regular meetings with Trudeau. Uh, and the government, uh, the civil servants will brief them on legislation. So what about when it's legislation that they don't like? Well, they've been briefed on it. They couldn't get anything. They're going to have to wear that as well. Mm. So I don't think that this in the long run is going to benefit them because they're going to have to wear the good with the bad. And the liberals are always going to try to take credit for the good. And they're certainly not going to take any credit for the bad. They'll they'll throw that mm-hmm. off them to right. the NDP. And, and then that, that all ends up with the ugly at the end of it, the good, the bad. Then you get the <laughs> ugly, and who knows where we go from there. Uh, thank you both. Uh, good to talk to you. Take care. You're all Thanks, guys. See you. And that is all for another edition of Primetime Politics on CPAC. I'm Peter Van Dusen from all of us here at CPAC. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.